you could de-energize the field. So if you had a disk with subdivisions going this way, back that way, this way, and back the other way, then when you spun this disk between these fields, you would cause an alternating magnetic field. If you put windings on that field, you have a generator that's far uh, beyond the current that could be generated by this disk generator. And this could be as big as uh, the watt meters we just uh, yeah. showed. And that's you all generate, you need. You get an oscillating magnetic field with windings around it, and you could get a lot more energy this way. And this is, this is how most of his technology that got high output worked. But he described one generator that was special that, that we don't have anything on, the government's concealed it, that the output was phenomenal. And uh, it sounds like the watt hour meter from his description of it. Wow. From what we can get our hands on. And uh, just for good measure here, we have just another photograph of, of the same thing, basically, with, with the magnets and the disk, the weak magnets in the front here, yeah. and the disk going through it. Um, and this business. <laughs> That's just to, to measure the disk span. But the, the one that I hooked up backwards, the disk would rotate fastest when the current usage was lowest. And then as it, the usage went up, it began to sit stationary and uh, vibrate, and then it began to rotate the opposite direction. And, uh, so it indicated to me it's generating more power than it's, uh, than it's being used at that point when it's going backwards. When it's at stationary, the center of load is generating as much as, as you're using. And the, the fact is, is during World War II, the Germans used some of these devices, which were powered by projected beam. Uh, they were robotic devices. Uh, what kind of projected beam? Would that be microwave? Power beam. Uh, it's a special beam that Tesla developed, uh, and he described it. He described the device around 1915 as his dirigible torpedo, which he had tested and he said it was capable of uh, 300 miles a second, which is 1.5 million miles per hour. Do you and think he was exaggerating? A lot of people feel that. I don't that think that was, it may not have been an exaggeration. I don't know how fast this ship that I saw was capable of going, but I know that it had a way of, and from the way I understand the technology, it's totally different from this, this air spike thing. Uh, the way the flying saucer technology works, it's it's explained in the 1890, in 1890s writings of Tesla and a few other major scientists in the world. Uh, the, the ether particles are stretched in the front with a DC brush discharge. Uh, that brings in something called the tubes of force, which are electrical force that carry momentum. And when this enters the ship and are dissolved in the ship, uh, it imparts momentum at 90 degrees to the electric and magnetic forces. Uh, so on the in respect, you, you can control yes. momentum. Uh, yeah, it's, it all or has you can to... Control, can you control inertia yes. electrically? Well, the way I understand it, and just from my own analysis, inertia and momentum are the same thing. Uh, inertia is the tendency of a body to remain at rest or in its state of, in its particular state of motion, whereas momentum well, momentum is the same thing. Uh, bodies in motion tend to remain in motion. Uh, uh, however, <clears throat> according to Tesla and J.J. Thompson, the discoverer of the electron, momentum is the product of these tubes of force which exist in space, and they're at random until they're united by this, by this brush discharge or by a body moving through space then that body accumulates a certain number of these tubes and that imparts momentum to the body. Mm. So if you can block these ether particles from passing, you can block inertia. And that's exactly what Tesla's... So this is actually in the literature uh, by J.J. Uh, Thompson and Tesla. Yes. We're talking the 1800s. Yes. Getting back to uh, saucer technology, German saucer technology, um, you claim in your book that you uh, were at a salvage yard and had collected something. Uh, in fact, you have a photograph in the book. You call it a pile compass. Could you explain a little bit about that? 
Well, literally, pal tocter compas means polar slave compass. Tocter meaning daughter, so it's kind of a little humor in there, German humor, that the daughter is equivalent to a slave. Uh, but what that means is that this is a slave compass, so there's a master compass, which is a gyro. Uh, the gyro is the master compass, and the, the polar slave compass will then pick up the heading that is calibrated into the master gyro, uh, which uh, this particular device is it's mounted this way, so the dial is 360 degrees this way. It's, it's set off in 30 degree increments, and it has a dial here which you turn 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right. You can also do 60, 90, any 30 degree increment. But this device then has a little electric motor on it so that when the ship changes directions, let's say that you turn the flying saucer 90 degrees to the right. Well, pilot, the main compass is calibrated to show true north. So when the ship starts moving this direction, then this little motor cuts on and rotates a dial that's with gears on it around to show you the correct flight heading according to true north on the master compass. And the reason this kind of device was necessitated in the first place was because the flying saucer has a electric field around it that makes an ordinary compass totally useless. And another reason is the flying saucer moves so fast that you're you're going to be over the next state in a few seconds, you know if you don't cut the power. And uh, so this particular one that I have is a primitive device compared to what they must have now. Uh, but it was the only thing they could come up with to navigate these saucers. And uh, these devices which you have here, you have a couple. Yeah. We have here um, something from an American salvage yard uh, in California. Uh, very similar to uh, what Mr. Lein's talking about as far as a, uh, uh, the German version, as far as the 30-degree um, uh, increments, correct? Uh, and it has a, a dial which adjusts here. This thing is thrashed to bits, so you'll have to uh, excuse its shape. Um, and we have a, the specifications here. Indicator gyromagnetic compass type V7A, specification mill 15126A, uh, order number AF23804, stock number 62631570. Kierkraft, com I'm sorry, Kierfot Company Incorporated, property of U.S. government. Uh, I bought it at a salvage yard, so everything's totally legal. <laughs> uh, and it's very similar to what uh, Mr. Line is talking about in his book. Uh, you might want to uh, point out the similarities or differences. Uh, well, do you feel that uh, this was from an airplane or, or a oh, saucer? Yeah. Or? This is probably this is Air Force USAF Type V Seven A. Now, uh, this is not the same kind of device that I have, though. But it uses uh, some of the same technology. This is a navigator. Uh, device that will give a true reading for north, south, in, in different degrees. And it's graduated for any of these headings on here. Uh, the one that I have, the reason I knew what it was when I saw it was because when I was a, uh, a boy, I slept in the backyard to watch these ships coming from New Mexico at night, flying in squadrons. And they would turn in 30-degree increments, 30, 60, 90, 180. And I could tell they were, they were at very high altitude, and I hadn't seen one up close. All I could do was see them in the sky at night, high in the sky.